take a little bit of a different tact uh, on this talk uh, mm -hmm. and talk about our efforts to really uh, validate interventions that may slow aging. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about mice, but mostly about some initial human studies with one of the natural products that we've been working on. Um, if I could have the, the well, maybe there's a, ah, I can do it, great. So we've been uh, devoting our lab recently to uh, trying to study a number of different interventions that have been proposed either through our own research or through research in other labs in the longevity space. And I would just point out that there are quite a large number of molecules now that have been proposed in one organism or another to impact longevity. So you can see that uh, there are over a thousand distinct drugs in the drug age database. A hundred of those or so have been tested in mice. Uh, and the ones on the left are ones that uh, we've been working on in our lab. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about them all in detail today. I'll just point out that we have a long history working with rapamycin, which I still think is a, a gold standard for extending longevity in animal models, at least. Uh, we've also seen very positive effects with studies in spermidine and vitamin A. Uh, and I'm just going to touch on uh, some studies today with gemfibrozil, urolithin, and glycine, um, and then talk more about alpha-ketoglutarate in human studies. So we've been sort of doing our own version of the famous NIA-ITP program uh, to test multiple uh, small molecules. And the reason we've done this is because we are taking them into human studies, and I'll tell you how we're doing that. Uh, and we want to validate which things work uh, in our hands to get a second site of validation for many of these small molecules uh, before we take the time and effort and costs to do the human studies. So uh, we've changed how we do the protocol a bit. And so instead of, um, instead of uh, doing full survival studies, we start our studies at about 18, 17 to 18 months of age, uh, treat for about eight months and then harvest the animals. So we don't get survival data out of these studies. That's the downside. The upside is that they're much faster. Uh, we rely on the mouse frailty test by Susan Howlett and colleagues uh, to measure frailty in the animals. And we have the ability to do a number of behavioral tests, uh, fax analysis of immune cells, et cetera. But finally, we can uh, harvest all of the tissues at the end of the experiment, which is not so easy if you let the mice go till death. So we can look at a number of different aging clocks as well. So I'll just show you one of the most recent studies. Uh, and that's where we tested four different compounds uh, at two different doses. And one of the things that's not done in animal studies is doing uh, a, a dose response curve or testing multiple doses of compounds. And so, I understand the reason for that. It's very cost you know, inefficient to test multiple doses. On the other hand, you're really taking a shot in the dark if you just test one dose with a small molecule. And I think that we've tried to at least double that so that we get a better range of what's happening. So we tested each of these at two doses, uh, moderate power uh, per each cohort in both males and females. Uh, and I, I just want to summarize what this kind of data looks like. Uh, it's very important to do the males and females because we get very different results for many of these compounds. And we also get different results for uh, different doses uh, of compounds. So in this case, a molecule that we're really excited about, gemfibrozil, uh, lowers frailty in the female population. And in that case, the two doses we chose, which were at the lower and the higher end of what's been given to mice before, really don't have any impact on the outcome. Both of them reduce frailty in the animals. And we've done a lot of work now on gemfibrozil, which is a fibrate, and I'll talk about that just briefly in a minute. Uh, but this is one of our favorite molecules to look at now for longevity. Uh, but on another hand, if you look at a molecule like glycine, we can see that the dosing is important. And it's actually the lower dose that dramatically reduces frailty with no significant effects in the uh, higher dose. And so I think that it, this, just to reiterate that it's important to, to look across a range of doses if at all possible. And one of the things we're really, I, I should point out that urolithin, I'm not going to show the data, is also very positive in the male population in reducing frailty. And I'm happy to talk about that. Um, one of the things we've been doing this far also is we want to start combining molecules to see which combinations work better. And 
I can tell you right now that if you combine two different things, you're more likely to cancel the effects of the, each other out than it is to cause additive or synergistic effects. So I want to make this as a note of caution because so many people are out there now combining multiple kinds of supplements and drugs to enhance longevity. Uh, and honestly, if you're beyond two molecules, I have no idea what you're doing if you take that approach. And I just want to point out that if two things hit the same pathway, for instance, if you take both of them, you might be hitting that pathway too hard, and we have evidence for that in some contexts like TOR. So I think it's really important to combine molecules and do this kind of testing to try to develop a roadmap for uh, which pathways go together, or which molecules go together and which don't. Um, and one of the things we also have now focused on in the lab is to go beyond just hallmarks and pillars of aging. I think a lot of people thought when those papers were written that small molecules were going to hit one pillar or one hallmark and that would be the mechanism. But in reality, if you take something like rapamycin or AKG or many of the other molecules, they hit all of the hallmarks and all of the pillars. And really because I think those are outputs of a, a homeostatic network that's keeping you healthy. So if you keep an animal healthier, perhaps by hitting a node in that network, you can read that out as an improvement in metabolism or senescence or inflammation, but it's not necessarily telling you what the direct mechanism of the small molecule, and that means it's hard to put things together and make predictions. So we've gone back and taken more biochemical approaches now to find the actual targets of these particular drugs, because we think that's going to be more meaningful when we think about how to combine them. And so that's, we're using a process called SETSA, a thermal shift assay, based on the idea that when a drug binds to a protein, it stabilizes it at a higher temperature. And we're working with Por Nordland, who's in Singapore, and also Sweden, Sweden uh, who's helping us out a lot with these studies. We've applied it to two different molecules, gemfibrozil and urolithin. And in both cases now, we think we have confirmed targets that are linked to aging for these small molecules. So I think it's important to apply this across a range of drugs uh, in the case of Jim Fibrazil, it's interesting because PPAR alpha was thought to be the target, and we think that is that data is wrong. That PPAR alpha is not the primary target, even for hypertriglyceridemia, and certainly not for aging. And what we've been able to show is that it affects amino acid transport in the gut, and we think that's one of the mechanisms by which it's affecting longevity. I can talk about that more if you're interested. Uh, your lithin also, we have a target that I, we're not confident enough of quite yet to talk about publicly, but I think this approach using uh, unbiased proteomics to screen for drug targets has improved dramatically and we should be applying that to anything affecting longevity. Um, I want to switch to human studies and so we got interested in this molecule alpha ketoglutarate as part of a collaboration with a company uh, where we were looking for combinations of natural products that affect lifespan and health span and that really got us on this whole idea of how to combine things. And that's where we found out life is much harder than we thought in this area. So we were taking months starting, mice starting at 18 months of age, at this point taking them all the way to death, uh, and then measuring a whole range of parameters in the mice. And I think the key result is here. Uh, the, this is just the AKG. It made the animals live about 5 to 10 percent longer. It wasn't that robust of an effect on lifespan. But the effect on health span was profound, at least if you consider frailty a measure of health span. And so uh, over here, at 18 months at the start of the experiment, the frailty is low. It goes up steadily. The control animals in blue, frailty goes up more dramatically than the AKG-treated animals. Now, this is not a great way of presenting this data because, like, for instance, this animal had very high frailty at 23 months and was dead at 25 months, and so it's not on the graph anymore. Uh, and so what we've done is gone back and plotted it based on the percent of the animal's lifespan where the frailty measure was taken. And when you do that, you see about a 50% reduction in frailty with AKG in the female animals and the same, similar results in males. Uh, so in this case, um, we got quite excited about AKG and the company um, started working uh, with the product even more. Now, AKG does a whole range of different things. It affects multiple pillars of aging, as I indicated. It's a central uh, metabolite in the TCA cycle. It declines with aging. And supplementing it back up can improve stem cell function, metabolic flexibility, and a number of other things. I want to just briefly mention microbiome because we now believe that 
the uh, protecting the barrier function in the colon is one of the big benefits that AKG is providing. Uh, I'm not going to show data on that. And so uh, the company did two studies now, uh, clinical studies, uh, with their product, which is uh, AKG time release plus vitamin A for males and plus low dose vitamin D for females. Um, and the first one was a non placebo controlled study. It's just users taking the product and submitting their methylation te testing to try to determine biologic age from methylation clock. Uh, and this was done in saliva a number of years ago, so it was a relatively simple methylation clock that was available at the time. There were 42 people in the study. The average uh, duration of taking the product was seven months. Uh, and uh, like I said, we used a methylation clock to measure. Uh, whether they're changing uh, biologic age. We can discuss the validity of these clocks. I'm sure that'll come up in the, in the talks in, the, in this meeting. I don't want to take much time today. So when these lines are going up, that means over the seven-month people, period, people are getting biologically younger. Uh, and we saw about a seven-year change in their biologic age in, in the seven months of treatment. Um, bigger effect than I expected, and I do believe placebo does have an effect. If you're paying $100 a month for a product to be younger, you're probably younger by a small fraction. Hopefully not as, hopefully that's not the only effect we're seeing here. I think what interested me the most, though, was that there were two parameters that really predicted the response of the individual. One is their chronologic age, and actually people that were chronologically older responded better. Uh, the other was their biologic age relative to their chronologic age. And so if people were not aging well, in other words, their biologic age was higher than their chronologic age, they responded better to the product. If they were already aging very well, the response was lower. Uh, and I wonder whether we'll see this kind of effect in other longevity interventions as well as AKG. This may be a, a general principle of, of what we begin to see in these kinds of studies, but it's too early to know. So we, this was repeated at Indiana University uh, in a uh, placebo-controlled study, 100 participants. Um, and this is where we kind of made a mistake designing the study uh, because we wanted to choose people 45 to 65 that were healthy. So that, that was the inclusion criteria. Uh, and when you do that, it turns out that and then you do uh, Morgan Levine's phenoage clock on them, you find out that they're about five to seven years biologically younger than their chronologic age at the start of the experiment. Uh, and we didn't know the results I just showed you before, but that suggested that those are the very people that are least likely to respond to the intervention. Uh, and that's more or less what we saw. So if you, uh, you this is Morgan Levine's phenoage clock, uh, you can get it either from methylation or from using blood parameters, they're, they're correlated to each other. And so this is the effect we see. So here you have the uh, baseline chronologic age and the amount of change per every three months of visit in the study. And what you can see is if you draw a line here at five years younger than the chronologic age, there's basically no response to the product. If you look at people that are increasingly biologically older, they respond to the product, but at the ends, and that you can see there is statistical significance in this regression. Uh, although, if you compare the overall data to placebo, it's not different because the vast majority of people we selected were biologically very young at the start of the experiment. So, uh, we're now going back and trying to think about how to design these experiments. We're starting another one at National University of Singapore. This is with just the sustained release AKG. And in this case, we're using as inclusion criteria being biologically older than your chronologic age using a combination of methylation clocks. Uh, so I'm not sure whether this is the right way to go for all of these studies. I, I think it's a reflection of the fact that we're, it's still a little bit in the unknown how to do human longevity studies and trying to slow or reverse age and whether these are the right parameters or um, or we have to continue to refine that, I think is still something we'll learn as we go. At NUS, we're really focused on doing these kinds of studies with Andrea Meyer, who many of you know, who moved to NUS recently. And uh, so we have resources to do several intervention studies, and we want to take a relatively agnostic approach, looking at multiple different kinds of interventions to see which ones work the best in which populations. 
So, the, the, but we're still learning as we go how to set these studies up. So, more on that as we go. I, we're also very collaborative in Singapore, and we're happy to collaborate with others as well. So, for instance, we have just completed a biologic aging study of 10,000 Singaporeans, which represent all three ethnicities. Uh, Chinese Han, uh, Malay, and Indian. Particularly in the Malay and Indian populations, we know very little about aging and longevity, and so it's important, I think, that we assess that. Uh, there's some interesting parameters that come out of this study, which will be published soon. Uh, we're doing a much deeper phenotyping of 450 Singaporeans across an age range, and so that's stuff almost completed, that clinical study. As I mentioned, the intervention pipeline, we'll probably do rapamycin next if we can get approval, and we have many other collaborations and other cohorts. So um, I think it's really important that, as someone who's worked in animal models my whole life, I think it's really important to transition, and, and the field needs to really validate which of these candidate interventions are working in human populations. And I think that'll be one of the, the biggest uh, f findings in the longevity field over the next decade. There's several groups that are doing it in different kinds of ways, and, and I, we'll figure out the best strategies and what works best, hopefully, in the next few years.